Hello and welcome to the first episode of Open to Question, a talk show on which you will hear the most interesting voices in the world of politics and policy, government and law. My guest today is Rajya Sabha MP Jairam Ramesh. As a former Union Environment Minister, who is currently the Chairman of Parliament's Standing Committee on Science and Technology, Environment, Forests and Climate Change, he is eminently suited to talk about what can only be described as a climate emergency. In 1972, India's Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was the only head of government to have the foresight to accept the then Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme's invitation to a meeting that was to launch the creation of the United Nations Environment Program. Her speech there was path-breaking and has been described as a foundation stone for much of the cooperation, disagreement, and politics that would develop around climate change. 50 years on at the recent Stockholm 50 plus conference earlier this month, Mrs. Gandhi's speech was again recalled at the opening ceremony. This would suggest that India is acknowledged as one of the first countries in the world to recognize the importance of preserving the environment. And yet, India has been ranked last in the 2022 Environmental Performance Index released earlier this month. Jairam, perhaps you could begin by explaining to us why Indira Gandhi's speech continues to resonate across the globe half a well, century later. Well, I think, you know, it's important. Um, she gave this speech on the 14th of June, 1972. So it's almost exactly 50 years ago. And it's the first time that environmental issues were looked at from a developmental angle. And it's for the first time the developmental issues were looked at from an environmental angle. You know, till that time, the environmental issue was seen to be an issue affecting only rich countries, developed countries, problems of chemical contamination, pesticides, problems of pollution, uh, and the problems uh, associated with developing countries were seen to be those associated with um, overpopulation. This was the debate on environment uh, till uh, Mrs. Gandhi gave her speech. And what she did was to integrate development and environment. Uh, she said there are a large number of countries like India who have to create jobs, who have to industrialize, who have to urbanize, who have to raise the standard of living. But they have to do it in an ecologically sustainable manner. Uh, and that without international cooperation, this is simply not possible. And she also said that it's not overpopulation that is the problem. It is actually overconsumption. Uh, a country like the United States, for example, with 5% of the world's population, accounted for almost over 30% uh, of consumption uh, of, of natural resources. So I think that's what was important about that speech. She was the only head of government other than Olaf Palme, the prime minister of Sweden. Uh, she spoke. She spoke about issues of pollution. She spoke about issues of deforestation. She even talked about global warming. She didn't use the word climate, but she suddenly used the word global warming. Uh, and, you know, she was a naturalist. She was a conservationist uh, by passion, by instinct, uh, by her own life experience. So that was a defining moment in the international discourse on the environment. Uh, perhaps the most significant part of her speech or the one that is most quoted had her say, open quotes, on the one hand, the rich look askance at our continuing poverty. On the other, they warn us against their own methods. We do not wish to impoverish the environment any further. And yet we cannot for a moment forget the grim poverty of large numbers of people. Are not poverty and need the greatest polluters? Close quotes. So is poverty still the biggest polluter today? No, I think what she was trying to convey, uh, Smita, was the fact that uh, in India, India was still a poor country. Uh, in India was an industrializing country, was an urbanizing country. Uh, and problems associated with poverty, problems associated with land degradation, lack of access to water. I mean, these are all what we don't normally consider to be 
traditionally environmental issues. And what she did was expand the scope uh, of what was considered to be environmental issues. And she said it's not just pollution. Uh, it's lack of development, uh, which affects the environment as well. Uh, and I think that's what she was trying to... Uh, she was, in fact, the, the favorite phrase that Indira Gandhi used throughout her prime ministership of 16 years was ecological balance. This was her favorite word. And what she was trying to convey was that on the one hand, India has to grow faster. It has to industrialize. It has to urbanize. It has to build more factories. Uh, it must you know, have higher rates of economic growth to create jobs. But at the same time, uh, we've got to be very careful about air, about water, about land, uh, you know, about consumption. So, you know, this this balance is this fine balance between environment and development. You cannot be an eco-fundamentalist, uh, an enviro-fundamentalist, but you can't be a growth fundamentalist either. Uh, you have to bring about a balance between the two. And I think the ending of her speech uh, where she ends the speech by quoting from the Atharva Veda, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a beautiful, uh, beautiful shloka, which says that you take out from the earth what you can put in. So that's balance. You know, that's you compensate for what you're taking out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think she was trying to convey that um, in India, we are very much used to living in harmony with nature. We are very much used to respecting nature. Uh, and we could do without lectures, uh, uh, you know, and homilies from the developed countries. But we have to find our own answers. So I think that that's what's the essence of her speech. So, so you don't think that a developing country like India needs to become rich before it can protect the environment? It has. Well, you know, I have always believed that you know you cannot uh, you cannot you cannot follow the grow now pay later model. You know, the grow now, pay later model is the model of the Americans, is the model of the Europeans. It's certainly the model of the Chinese, uh, which is, you know, you grow for 25 years, 30 years, uh, and then you worry about the consequences uh, of economic growth later. I think that luxury is simply not available to us uh, in India, particularly. Uh, it's not available to us because uh, of, of a variety of reasons. Let me give you four reasons why... India cannot follow the grow now, pay later model. Number one, we are extraordinarily dependent on the monsoon. Uh, you know, uh, our economy, our agriculture, our livelihoods depends on the monsoon. So any unpredictability on the monsoon uh, will wreak havoc on our people's lives and on the economy. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, we are seeing the retreat of the Himalayan glaciers. Uh, that has implications for water supply, uh, you know, in the North Indian rivers particularly. Number three, we are seeing an increase in mean sea levels, uh, which affects uh, the 7,500 kilometer long coastline, areas like the Sundarbans, uh, areas, you know, uh, in like Goa, like Cochin in Kerala, or on the eastern coast of India. Uh, and fourthly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, we are now beginning to see the public health consequences, uh, you know, of what we do uh, in terms of economic growth. Uh, you know, people are uh, people are facing problems of public health. Uh, pollution is having a morbidity impact. It's having a mortality impact. People are falling ill because of environment. People are dying because of environmental issues. So I think this luxury which other countries had of grow now, pay later. Uh, let's have 8% of economic growth for 25 years and we'll clean up later. Uh, you know, or you deforest your way to prosperity or you pollute your way to prosperity is a luxury that India simply does not have. So we have to balance. We have to walk on both legs. Uh, we have to have economic growth, but we have to protect our environment. We have to protect our forests. We have to protect our air. We have to protect our water. Uh, and as COVID-19 has demonstrated, in many ways, COVID-19 is the other side, is the public health side mm -hmm. of environmental imbalance, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of habitats, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, you know, the path that other countries have followed 
uh, is not a path that India can or should follow. In 1972, Mrs. Gandhi had referred to the North-South problem, where she referred to the affluence of the North emerging from its domination of other countries and their resources. Since then, many people have tried to, to dismantle these differences. How much has changed and in dissolving these differences? Well, in 50 years, Smita, we have a North-South problem in India itself. Mm -hmm. What is the North-South problem uh, in the world? The North-South problem in the world is you have a set of, set of rich countries uh, with high consumption and set of poor countries with lower consumption. Mm -hmm. But in the last 50 years, mm -hmm. the remarkable progress that India has made uh, and you know other countries like Brazil and China, Indonesia have made, but I'm speaking from the Indian perspective. In the last 50 years, we have uh, a, a North-South problem within our country in, in the sense that you mm -hmm. have uh, a population which is consuming as much as their counterparts uh, in the developed countries. And you have a large majority of the population, you know, still lacking access uh, to basic requirements like electricity, uh, water, clean air and so on. So, you know, this imbalance, uh, which Mrs. Gandhi talked about at the international level 50 years ago, uh, today that imbalance is visible domestically uh, within India. We have a set of, uh, you know, high, uh, you know, high consumption uh, population, resource consumption population, and you have a large majority of people uh, eking out subsistence living uh, at low levels of per capita consumption of electricity, for example. So I think both these are important. The rich poor differential on the world stage, which Indira Gandhi talked about. But now, in addition to that, you have the rich poor differential within countries like India, which are large and populous. In 1972, when the first Stockholm conference took place, there was a political declaration on the human environment that countries should limit their sovereignty so as not to harm others. In 2015, in the 2030 agenda on the sustainable development goals, countries went back to full permanent sovereignty. How, did, how do you view this change? And can global environmental problems such as climate change, loss of biodiversity, and land degradation be solved without a more nuanced approach to sovereignty? Well, you know, ultimately, environment is politics, Smita. You know, uh, we can live in a... We can talk about all till, uh, you know, we can, we can give high sounding phrases we can we can be very romantic ultimately it's a political issue what governments can do and governments will do and this balance between environment and development is a political balance that governments work out as part of a democratic process mm. so uh, you know uh, in at the paris summit in 2015 uh, countries committed uh, to doing things which they felt uh, was politically acceptable domestically. You know, no country uh, will call for a reduction in consumption standards. Uh, you know, it, uh, all, all elected governments particularly uh, will always, you know, look for higher standards of living, uh, for a better quality of life, for mm. better, more consumption of electricity, uh, for, more consum for more production of automobiles, uh, mm. for example. So, uh, at Paris in 2015, the agreement was not a perfect agreement, uh, mm. but it was an agreement that was arrived at what I would say a bottom-up process that mm. every country undertook mm. to fulfill certain obligations and commitments uh, mm. on the international stage, hold themselves accountable for it. And this, of course, was reiterated in Glasgow uh, last year. Uh, so we have... Uh, 
we don't have a desirable uh, international framework today. We have an international framework uh, which is politically uh, acceptable, which has been negotiated uh, among countries, which countries feel they are able to sell to their domestic electorate. Uh, but of course, uh, it, also, it also means that there is a greater responsibility uh, on the developed countries like the United States and Europe and other countries to take on uh, a proportionately higher share uh, of obligations than developing countries like India. Uh, China, of course, is a developing country, but is responsible, uh, is the single largest emitter today. 27% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions comes from China alone. Uh, India, India accounts for about 5%. Uh, China accounts for about 27%. The United States accounts for about 15%. And the European Union for about 8%, 9% collectively. Uh, so uh, there is a thing called climate justice. There is a thing called equity. Uh, we cannot expect countries like India to take on uh, all the obligations and all the responsibilities. Countries like the United States, countries uh, of the Euro of the European uh, continent, uh, have to, uh, you know, have to play their, uh, you know, have to take on a greater share uh, because they have already reached levels of development, uh, you know, which India and China and Brazil are still aspiring to. But, you know, apart from this moral obligation on these more developed, uh, developed countries, uh, what can a country like India do to persuade them to take, you know, do their bit? Well, I, I always, when I was environment minister, uh, I always uh, believed that, um, you know, um, we cannot, uh, we can spend all the time we can trying to uh, hold others accountable uh, yes. and play the moral game. But I felt, frankly, our leadership comes from domestic actions. Yes. Uh, it doesn't come from uh, high sounding phrases and appeal uh, to moral conscience and so on. We can do that. But ultimately, we have to speak from a position of leadership. Uh, and when I was environment minister, when I first became an environment minister in 2009, uh, you know, I made a number of speeches in parliament. Uh, we had uh, a number of debates in parliament. And the point I made was that India has to take climate change seriously uh, because uh, we are most affected. We are most affected because of the monsoon. We are most affected because of the coastal areas. We are most affected because of the glaciers. We are most affected because of the forests. And we are most affected because of public health and population. So it, it took me a long time. And I was criticized bitterly in parliament by many parties. Um, some of my own colleagues in government were not convinced. Uh, but I'm glad that 10 years later, uh, you know, 12 years later today, People have woken up to the challenge of climate change. It's not a futuristic challenge. It's a challenge that we are facing as we speak. Yeah. Uh, urban heat, for example, has become uh, a daily feature of our lives across the country, where uh, average temperatures in many cities uh, has gone up by uh, at least one to one and a half degrees Celsius. Mm. And this has devastating consequences on people's lives and livelihoods. So, you know, 10 years ago, we thought that we were not part of the problem. So we, you know, we can afford not to be part of the solution. Uh, but my position was that we may not be part of the problem, but we are certainly have to be a leader in devising a solution because it is in our interest. Uh, you know, we are not doing anybody else a favor. We are vulnerable. Uh, so we have to be, we may not have emitted as much as the Americans have or the Europeans have or the Chinese have. But we are suffering and we are there is no country in the world which is suffering uh, as much as India is suffering because the suffering is on multiple counts, as I mentioned to you. So that was the position I took 10 years ago. Uh, I was criticized. I was attacked. But today, this is the mainstream view. And I'm glad in parliament, in government, uh, in the media, today people are talking of climate change uh, as an existential reality, not as something that will happen 20 years from now or 30 years from now. Uh, I mean, for I, I've just come back, you know, from 
uh, different parts of India where people, you know, told me I came back from Karnataka after my recent election. A number of people came and told me that their mango crop has been completely destroyed this year because of the increase in temperatures. The wheat crop uh, this year uh, has seen a very sharp fall uh, because of, uh, uh, the, you know, the temperatures that have been uh, prevailing over the last 35 to 40 days. So we are already confronting uh, the consequences of global warming and climate change. And that's why India has to be a leader. India has to walk the talk. Uh, you know, we are experts at talking, but not necessarily experts at walking. But we have to walk the talk. So basically, you're saying that irrespective of what other countries say or do, uh, we have to take a sensible approach. Absolutely. See, the traditional Indian position has been, was, at least till I became minister, that, you know, we will do things only if the developed countries give us money. Uh, we will do things only if the developed countries gave technology to us. And I changed that position. And I was attacked. Some of the negotiators who were part of my negotiating team themselves were critical of my position, saying, no, 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 uh, we must get money from the West. We must get technology from the West. And if we start doing this, our economic growth will suffer. Uh, but uh, I stood my ground and I said, no, we must do things on our own. And India is a large country. India is a resourceful country. It has the people. It has the financial resources. It can mobilize it uh, in order to you know, make the investments require, required for dealing with climate change. And uh, the impact on economic growth uh, is not going to be very large uh, uh, as, as was being feared. So it was a big uphill struggle for me. It was a struggle for me within government. It was a struggle for me in Parliament, uh, it was a struggle for me uh, in the media uh, and amongst the NGOs. You know, many of the NGOs in India, uh, you know, talk about climate justice and equity, and you know, they play on the guilt conscience of the of the Western world. And here I was, minister, saying, "No, no, let's let's turn the spotlight on ourselves and let's do things from a position of leadership." So I think that's what. Uh, uh, I saw, for example, you know, I made multiple visits to China and I saw the Chinese position. The Chinese position was bash the West in international forums, but domestically uh, do all you can, uh, you know, to make sure that you are uh, in, a, in a leadership position. Uh, so that's the change that came about in India's position 10 years ago. And I'm glad that today that position is accepted by people across the political and ideological spectrum. How to create an account on Kulke? Install the Kulke app from Play Store or App Store or visit kulke.com. Enter a whole new world of conversations. Click on create an account. Select your age. Enter your email ID or mobile number to receive a verification code. Enter the code and continue. Enter your name. Style your profile with the username of your choice. Create and confirm your password. Enter the invite code. Not invited? Don't worry, you can earn an invite. By inviting just 5 friends to join Kulke. Select what interests you. Follow users with similar interests and create your flock. Enjoy Kulke for the love of conversations. You know, on climate change, India has been going to the negotiations ever since these international negotiations began. India has participated in the IPCC reports. Why is it that in the last 30 years, India has not developed a clear plan to phase out fossil fuels and to leave the world in other renewable technologies? Well, you know, we we have I have been advocating that, for example, by the year 2040, India mm. must announce that no petrol or diesel vehicles will be sold. The Europeans have announced a target date of 2035. The Americans also have, um, you know, uh, announced this date. And I feel it's em eminently doable with the, uh, and I said this in Parliament in the last session when Mr. Nitin Gadkari was talking of electric vehicles. And I said, why don't you set an ambitious target that by 2040, you're not going to use fossil fuels. 
uh, particularly in the area of transportation. Mm -hmm. it's, a doable, uh, it's a doable trajectory. So we have to think bold. Uh, we have to set clear targets for ourselves. Uh, I think there's been a dramatic increase in solar energy capacity, particularly uh, in the last 10 years. For example, uh, when I became minister, the price of solar power was almost 15 rupees a unit. Today, uh, solar bids are being opened in state after state, where the price of electricity is about two and a half to three rupees a unit. So you look at the dramatic decline uh, in the price uh, that we have seen. The costs have fallen Prices have fallen, uh, and the government has taken advantage of it. And I, that's good. We should move ahead. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be very clear. Uh, there are some areas where we will continue uh, to have uh, be dependent on fossil fuels. Electricity, I'm afraid, is one area in the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, we are not going to be uh, fossil fuel free. We are still going to be today about 65% of our electricity comes from coal. Uh, and with the most aggressive of solar and wind, with the most aggressive of assumptions on nuclear power uh, by 2040, 50% of our electricity will still come from coal. Uh, so we need that fossil capacity, uh, fossil fuel capacity uh, for power generation, at least for the next 15 to 20 years. But there are specific sectors. And transportation, uh, I think, is, uh, is the most visible sector. And I believe that it is possible uh, for the government of India to say that by the year 2040, no petrol vehicle, no diesel vehicle uh, will be manufactured or sold in India. This is an eminently doable proposition. In, uh, in your article in The Hindu earlier this week, you have written, and I quote you, while the rhetoric in international forums has stressed India's environmental commitment, and while dramatic declines in costs have enabled a huge expansion in renewable energy capacity, a sense of discomfort on the current regime's actions at home will not be unjustified. In the name of, in the name of ease of doing business, the regulatory edifice is under systematic assault and enforcement, always weak, has further slackened. When Indira Gandhi spoke at Stockholm, the public health consequences of environmental misgovernance did not occupy center stage. They do today. Could you expand on that? Well, you see, um, you know, over the last couple of years, what's bothered me, when I mean, I've been chairman of the Parliament Standing Committee on Environment as well, uh, Environment, Climate Change and Forest. What's, what's bothered me is that there's been a progressive dilution of environmental laws, uh, forest laws, uh, the environmental clearance process, the Environmental Protection Act of 1986, the Comprehensive Environmental Protection Act of, 19, uh, of 1986. We have the Water Pollution Control Act of 1974. We have the Air Pollution Control Act of 1980. Uh, then we have the Forest, Con uh, sorry, the Air Pollution Control Act of 81. We have the Forest Conservation Act of 1980. We have the Environment Protection Act of 1986. And then we have a slew of other rules and regulations related to the protection coastal areas and so on. Now, over the last seven, eight years, uh, in order to send a signal that, you know, we are reducing regulations, increasing the ease of doing business, improving our ranking internationally, indices of competitiveness, uh, the casualty has been environment and forest laws. So there's been a progressive dilution. Institutions like the National Green Tribunal uh, have uh, systematically weakened. Mm -hmm. And the environment minister gets up in parliament and says, you know, I have cleared 3,000 projects. The job of the environment minister is not to clear projects. The job of the environment minister is to protect the forests. Mm -hmm. uh, the job of the environment minister is to uh, uh, in enforce the law. Uh, mm -hmm. And when the former environment minister got up and said, you know, uh, I've cleared 3,000 projects, I was forced to stand up and say, my friend, uh, you are not to clear your job is not to clear to be judged by the number of projects you have to be cleared you have to be judged by the amount of area of forest you have protected or the amount of coastal areas you have protected mm -hmm. or the toughness with which you have enforced environmental laws mm -hmm. but that's what bothers me uh, you know most that dominant theology you know in international forums we all talk about india being uh, you know 
uh, we quote from the Vedas and we quote from the Upanishads. Uh, and, you know, there's always a Sanskrit shloka for every fine uh, thought. Prakriti rakshati rakshataha. You know, nature protects those who protect it. You know, you can quote all these things from the Atharva Veda and, you know, from the other Upanishads. They are Brahadaranyata Upanishads, named after the forest. But ultimately, what do you do? What are you doing on the ground? How are you enforcing your laws? How are you strengthening your institutions? Uh, are you diluting your standards for air pollution from thermal particles? If these are the issues, uh, how are you ensuring that the environmental clearance process, mm. uh, you know, uh, of course, it has to be transparent, it has to be mm. but it cannot be diluted if you're going to do it with public hearings. Mm. If you're going to say, as this government uh, said some time ago, that, you know, we will uh, give you ex post facto approval. In other words, you know, you, you start your project and, you know, later on you can get the clearance. I mean, these are totally unacceptable ways. Of bringing about the balance between the between environment and development. That's what I mean by saying that uh, you know our ministers, uh, uh, you know, and the ruling party. Everybody talks about the international. I think that rhetoric cannot be faulty. The question really is: uh, mm. How are the laws being enforced? How are the standards being enforced? How are the institutions uh, being strengthened? Those are the real issues. Let's see how to create a round table. First, open the Kulke app or visit kulke.com. Tap on the round table button at the bottom left. Click on the new button at the top right corner. Select the type of format for your round table. Be creative, give it a title and description. And remember, just like most things in life, keep it brief. Schedule your round table. Choose the type of round table you want. Add the usernames and introduction of the moderator and panelists. Add the categories and tags that best explains your round table. Add the picture because a picture speaks a thousand words. Invite people and that's it. Your round table has been created. Schedule your first round table on Kulke today. Do you think that India <clears throat> ranked last in the 2020 Environmental Performance Index is fair or is that assessment biased? Well, you know, uh, Smita, I have uh, on these indices, you know, I have, uh, I don't get too excited when we rank very high. Uh, I don't get too depressed. You know, when we get ranked very low, because you know there is a certain methodology for the construction uh, of these indices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are, it's not. I mean, I take them, I read them. Uh, for me, more important than the fact that we are ranked low on the index is the track record of what uh, governments do when they are in power. Uh, as I said, they're simple questions: uh, How toughly are you enforcing the law? Uh, how progressive are your standards mm. and regulations? How strong are your institutions? Mm. I mean, that's more important than, you know, some environmental uh, index, which, you know, gets a headline here uh, and the ministry, the government will respond uh, in saying that this index is imperfectly constructed. It does not, you know, uh, the, the wrong metrics have been used. I mean, this debate will take place and it's good for academics. It's good for research articles. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, after the recent uh, Stockholm conference, can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Can you see uh, me? No, uh, the current uh, environment minister, Bhupendra Yadav, he tweeted, and I quote, the developing world needs not just an industrial transition, but an industrial renaissance, a flowering of industries that will create jobs and prosperities along with the clean environment, close quotes. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I, I you know, I, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a sentiment that I cannot uh, quarrel with, certainly. Uh, and, you know, it's a fine sentiment. Uh, we, need, uh, we need the technology, we need the uh, technological advances, and we have seen these technological advances, particularly in the field of renewables. The scene has been transformed uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. 
uh, and uh, countries, uh, I mean, for example, Germany uh, is now become a world leader in the use of solar rooftops, mm -hmm. uh, something that India is uh, beginning to emulate. Uh, and I have no doubt in my mind that in the next 20 to 25 years, the contribution of renewables uh, to our energy basket uh, is going to increase very substantially. So there's no, there's no denying the fact, uh, uh, you know, for example, energy storage, yeah. the, the type of technological advances that will take place in the area of energy storage uh, will greatly improve the attractiveness of renewables. Because one of the problems of renewable energy is its intermittent power supply. You know, it can supply power only for, say, maybe 20 percent or 30 percent of the time at most. Uh, so uh, storage. Uh, battery technology will become very, very crucial. So I agree. I mean, these technological advances are going to play a very important role and India has to be uh, in the forefront. And, you know, uh, GDP is, we traditionally look at GDP as gross domestic product. I think increasingly we should be looking at GDP as green domestic product. We should be measuring, measuring GDP as green domestic product not necessarily as gross domestic product. What was Dr. Manmohan Singh's brief to you when you became environment minister? Well, uh, you know, he first thing he told me was on climate change, uh, he used the phrase that I used uh, at the beginning of our conversation. He said that, look, I want India to be part of the solution. We may not have been part of the problem, but I want India to be part of the solution. Uh, so he was very clear on climate change. Secondly, he said we have a very, uh, you know, we have a we have a, a very extensive regulatory system. Make sure that it gets uh, it's transparent. Make sure that it gets effectively enforced, uh, and make sure that uh, you know these regulations serve the purpose uh, for which they were intended. And thirdly, he said, you know, um, make sure that the institutions function. The Central Pollution Control Board, for example or the state pollution control boards, for example, make sure that, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they function effectively. So it was a very simple brief. It was a 20 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, that, that was his marching orders to me when I became minister in May of 2009. Uh, now we have a few questions from the audience. So I'll just read them out to you. Uh, uh, gentleman called Karthik, he wants to know, what has been the role of the NGT in stopping growth and development in India? Well, the NGT came about, you know, it was uh, India is only one of three or four countries in the world which has a specialized, uh, you know, a legal framework, the National Green Tribunal. It was set up by an act of parliament in 2010. Uh, and it was, um, uh, it was meant to uh, uh, enable public, uh, people like Karthik, uh, to approach uh, the National Green Tribunal, uh, you know, with their concerns uh, on their environment, on the environmental impact of projects. People could seek damages. People could seek a review of environmental decisions. It was holding the executive accountable uh, from an environmental point of view. And I think the National Green Tribunal, frankly, uh, in the last 12 years, uh, in spite of efforts uh, to weaken it, uh, has in fact played a very positive and constructive role. You know, in city after city, people, uh, NGOs have used it, concerned citizens have used it, uh, people have used it uh, in order to review uh, projects uh, which uh, they believe, citizens believe, not experts necessarily, which citizens believe will have adverse uh, environmental consequences. A steel flyover, for example, in Bangalore was stopped because of the National Green Tribunal. Mm. The cleanup of the Yamuna floodplain, you know, the, 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 uh, the ecological balance in the Yamuna floodplain in Delhi was disturbed, and that was uh, restored because of the intervention of the National Green Tribunal. There are many decisions like this. Uh, the, uh, the closure of the copper smelter in Tamil Nadu. Of course, many of these decisions uh, have been controversial because there are, you know, as I said, uh, industry would not like uh, these decisions. But, you know, I think the National Green Tribunal uh, has provided a, a vehicle for the involvement of citizens, for the involvement of 
people from all different walks of life uh, to seek uh, legal redress uh, for environmental concerns. That's very important, you know. Environment is not a technocratic issue. It's not merely a scientific issue. It shouldn't be only a political issue. It's a people's issue. So people who are affected by chemical contamination, people who are affected by pollution, uh, people who are affected by degradation can, can approach the National Green Tribunal. Let's see how to edit your profile details. First, open the Kulke app or visit kulke.com. Click on account at the bottom right corner and then tap on edit profile. To change your profile picture, click on the change button. Then, if you select capture, smile for the camera or go to the gallery to use a stored photo. To change your display name, go where your display name is shown and change to a name that you feel is right. Below that you can also update your bio with what you feel defines you, your interests, hobbies etc. You can specify your gender if you'd like. Go down to edit your date of birth. Select the day, date and year. You can also add your personal or business website link below. And, you can add your interest tags below to let others know what you like. Lastly, be sure to click save and enjoy your newly edited account on Kulke. Uh, Tilotama uh, uh, wants to know, uh, aren't countries in the temperate zone the most affected since they will face extreme weather conditions and might have to deal with a mini ice age? Well, we are already seeing the extreme conditions. I mean, for example, if you were to take the Indian monsoon, uh, the amount of rainfall India gets uh, over a 120-day period, which is the Indian monsoon period, June, July, August, September, the total amount of rainfall has not come down very significantly. But the number of rainy days has come down and the number of dry days has gone up. So we're getting the same amount of rainfall in lesser number of days. Now, that has implications for water management, it has uh, implications for water runoff, for groundwater recharge, and so on. Uh, so, extreme events, extreme heat, for example, that uh, we have uh, witnessed, uh, particularly this year, uh, in state after state, which is having very adverse consequences on, uh, on agriculture, uh, is a manifestation of the extreme events. The floods that took place uh, in Kerala, in parts of Karnataka, in Uttarakhand, uh, were uh, were uh, manifestations of this uh, of this phenomenon uh, of the increase in frequency of extreme events. So this frequency of extreme events has certainly gone up over the last decade and a half. Uh, and um, the example that I gave you of the monsoon is the most striking example. We traditionally have been used to 120 days of rainfall. Uh, today, the number of high rainfall days has come down very drastically. But over a 120-day period, the amount of rainfall has not declined. Uh, Elvis has a question. He asks, with a proper roadmap, how long do you think it will take for us to see a positive change in climate? Well, I, I would say, you know, the next 20 years, uh, it's going to be a long haul because we have already crossed the tipping point. Uh, but we have some good success stories. Uh, the international community got together uh, to stop the depletion of the ozone layer. Uh, and that, uh, you know, was a success story of the Montreal Protocol. So countries, uh, there is some success. Uh, climate, uh, a little more difficult. Uh, to deal with the loss of biodiversity, for example. In fact, loss of biodiversity and, and climate are both interlinked. At the Rio summit, at the Rio de Janeiro summit, Earth summit in 1992, there were two international conventions, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the UN Convention on Biodiversity. So, But they are interlinked. They're not separate. We cannot look upon them as separate, uh, you know, uh, agreements. I would say... It's a long haul uh, because, as I said, we have already crossed the tipping point in terms of uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide, in terms of the concentration of methane, uh, in terms of the concentration of nitrous oxides. 
uh, which are the global uh, greenhouse gases. We have already crossed the crucial tipping points. Uh, so we, you know, said, you know, if we are able, if we are able to move, make the transition in, in the transportation sector to begin with, uh, and if we are able to uh, ensure the revolution in energy storage, uh, which will uh, obviate the need for increasing coal-based capacity in order to provide the base load electricity, um, you know, uh, which uh, the renewables cannot and as of now, uh, that would certainly mean much. And this, I would say, is a 20 to 25-year uh, horizon. We have to take a 20 to 25-year horizon for these investments. Uh, what uh, we may, this, this may appear to be futuristic, but I think decisions we take now uh, will set us on a path uh, of meeting those targets, meeting those objectives, uh, say 20 years from now or 25 years from now. The, the, uh, we, we, you know, we, we should not take a 2050 perspective because that's a meaningless perspective. We're very, you know, uh, <laughs> it's too much in the future. We must, uh, we must have a roadmap, a five-year roadmap, a 10-year roadmap, a 15-year roadmap, and certainly a 20-year roadmap. Because, you know, you have, to, you have to hold yourself accountable. I mean, if I say something for 2050, I certainly won't be around to be held accountable. But if I say something for 2025 or 2030, chances are that you can still hold me accountable for what I say today. Uh, so I think we need, we need a medium-term perspective. Uh, my last question is about youth. I mean, we had Greta Thunberg, you know, uh, sort of, how, why is it that somebody, a young person like Greta Thunberg was able to draw attention uh, in a way that, you know, world leaders were not able to. And today we see a, a large number of young people and youth movements around the world uh, taking up this issue. Well, youth has the greater stake in the future than oldies like me, certainly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, Greta Thunberg appealed to the guilt conscience of the West. Uh, mm -hmm. She was young, she was articulate, she was mm -hmm. very presentable. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, um, so uh, and she was saying the right things. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but like you know, I was never a great fan of hers, frankly, if you ask me, mm -hmm. uh, because you know she was not in a position to take decisions. Mm -hmm. And only, you know, when you are in the seat of taking decisions, you know the compromises that you have to do, the 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 trade-offs you have to make. Mm -hmm. So Greta Thunberg's rhetoric is great, but when you're a minister for the environment or when you're prime minister of a country, you have to make difficult choices. You know? mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you make a choice which will please the environmentalists. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you'll make a choice which will displease the environmentalists. Mm -hmm. uh, but today, no doubt about it, that the youth movement, uh, the youth are far more uh, concerned about climate. Of course, in India, the youth is more worried about jobs. You know? mm. uh, they're more worried about livelihoods. They're more worried about day-to-day -day concerns mm. uh, compared, for example, to the youth in the Western countries. Mm. Because, you know, they come from uh, relatively uh, better, relatively secure economic backgrounds. And I don't blame the youth in India for putting jobs over the environment. Uh, they have to necessarily put jobs over the environment. It's the job of people like me. It's the job of people like the Prime Minister. It's the job of parliamentarians. It's the jo job of legislators to find the balance that will create the jobs for fulfilling the aspirations of youth, but yet do it in a manner that protects natural resources, that protects the air, protects water, protects land, uh, protects our forests. And I think that's... That's the real challenge that we have to, you know, that we have to uh, bring about this convergence uh, between uh, the priorities of economic growth in a country like India. You know, we have we have 10 million people getting into the labor force every year. So we have to generate 10 million jobs a year. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we can't we can't say mm. that uh, jobs are not the overriding priority employment is the overriding priority. Livelihood security is the overriding priority. Now, within that priority, uh, how do you integrate environment and development? That's the big challenge. So, you know, some, I've always believed that managing the environment is a one-step-forward, two-step-backward process. 
Uh, you, know, you cannot be you cannot be a growth purist. At the same time, you cannot be an ecological purist either. So on that very realistic note, uh, this wonderful conversation with Jairam Ramesh. Uh, thank you so much, Jairam. Thank uh, you, Smita. It was uh, a really it was fun. conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you.